Hello there, everyone. Uh, I'm Q here with uh, Pithy Dr. G. Uh, we're just going to do a brief uh, overview of the architects for National Treasure. Uh, you can just check the volume on both of us. I think it should be Hello. set. So let's get right. Charlie into had this. to do schoolwork, so the professor decided to blow off his academic responsibilities for, for a bit. All right, perfect, perfect. All right, Maddie's saying you can hear both of us pretty well. Perfect. All right, let's just go through this pretty quick. So we're doing architects rather than country states or, well, British colonies. And then there's going to be a total of 16 architects. And two people will be able to pick each architect. So 32 people in the normal field. Uh, the sign-up thread is going to go live at Axel's whim. Uh, and when it goes live, it's first come, first serve. So you want to pick quickly. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, each architect's only twice. Uh, he has a special rule about uh, Wheel of Death if you choose an architect that already has two picks. So we're going to try and keep the thread as up to date as possible on the day so that you'll be able to see who's already picked who's uh, architect, so you'll see what's still available. Just don't be that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the rule. There will be an alternate pool, so if, if you aren't available at that very specific time, uh, European time for once for a contest, then there will be an alternative pool. So there still will be a way to get in. And yeah. And then it'll just be a straight up 32, 16, 8, and then winner. So, and it'll be the coveted Reese Jones trophy. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I would recommend a backup uh, post. But yeah. Uh, design and publish window both open April 1st. And then, yeah, you can publish whenever until August 1st. Uh, I don't know how to make people mods, so I'm not sure how to delete it. Let's see. And... Yeah, don't, 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 don't let it get, don't let it uh, throw you off. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Uh, here we go. Make my stream chat being blocked up. All right, well, let's move on. Okay, sorry, I can, I can also riff if you need. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> got... that, was, that was just me trying to figure out. Um, I haven't really had to ban people from chat before or mod people, so I'll have to figure that out at a later date. All right, let's go straight in with the architects then. Our first one is going to be Seth Rayner, the protege. And so he was a protege of uh, C.B. McDonald, uh, but did quite a few works, not too many afterwards. So we're focusing mainly on Rayner's, I'm guessing, solo works more than his works with McDonald. Yeah, although really he, he was kind of the main guy aside from National Golf Link. So basically as long as you don't look at NGLA... It's mostly Rainer you're looking at. So yeah, uh, when it, when it comes to Rainer, he's he wasn't as strict with template use as uh, McDonald. He kind of riffed off it more indirectly. Uh, a lot of the whole names are were named after the fact, like they weren't named by Rainer per se. So some of them can be misattributed templates. But yeah, there's just a brief list of courses to look over uh, yeah. for inspiration. So something, yeah, something I'll add, you know, we're kind of deliberate with the courses here. Certainly, you know, if there if someone's done a really good version of a club, a course in the game or a good interpretation, you might want to consider going in a different direction. So, for example, um, you know, like. Grovey just did a really nice take on Fisher's Island. So, you, you know, we're not saying you can't do that, but if you're gonna if you're gonna do a Fisher's Island type course, you know, you better step up. You better bring it. Yeah. Another example is uh, 
Dan himself here has done a, a rip off Camargo Club. Well, actually, just kind of a renovation type thing with Shawnee Run. So maybe a Camargo Club style one also would be a bit part of a follow up to that as well. So, all right, uh, let's move on to our next architect, uh, Donald Ross, uh, the machine. Uh, yeah, he has a huge amount of golf courses to reference. Uh, literally, you could probably message Tanner about this, and he would literally give you an endless diatribe on this guy. So you have a resource if you pick Donald Ross. And then just some notable courses. So anything you want to say about Donald Ross, Dan? Um... No, not really. I think he's he. So just realize that not all he didn't do all of his greens like Pinehurst number two. In <laughs> fact, it's kind of a misconception that that's like how he liked to do greens because really those d turtle back greens really it's just from the greens getting top dressed for decades and decades so they get built up around their surrounds. Yeah. Uh, so uh -huh. so try not to be too like don't go for the obvious thing. That's kind of our. Our main advice and also for mctree's point we're trying to include lesser known golf courses or golf courses not necessarily used on uh, the pga tour as references when we can uh just because we don't necessarily want a pinehurst number two copy we don't really want a copy of any golf course necessarily we want a, a good mismatch doing an exact copy of pinehurst number two won't do you any favors in this contest is what i'll say no uh, or right. of any course yes all right moving on we have alistair mckenzie the other big hitter uh the good doctor mckenzie di designs are still revered worldwide and uh yeah uh here. this is kind of a very dangerous one because i I think it's pretty clear we don't want Augusta National courses from anyone. Right. And then also we've had kind of a Cypress Point type design in basically every contest up to this point. <laughs> so Yeah. Uh we've <laughs> so just if if you you know, just be very I'm not saying you can't do a moderate thing or something and and also it's not like you have to use the same settings that all their courses are set in, right? It's more no channeling their style in a setting that you want to design in yeah and uh usually unless it's like a big miss i do want to just double reference back that the course being good is still the most important factor when we judge courses in the contest like this it's more like a deciding like vote between two courses that are tied and how good we think they are is how well they execute a certain architect so when it comes to McKenzie, uh, just remember we're not we're not gonna be looking as much about how you replicate how well you replicated the McKenzie course and more about how good the course is itself first. I think I'll move on to the next architect. All right, old Tom Morris. So. <laughs> Old Tom is an interesting one because a lot of things are kind of misattributed to him. So <laughs> let's see here. When it comes to Old Tom, uh, just want to point out, uh, uh, we don't really want sideline bunkers. We don't want you to think you have to do anything crazy like that. Because uh, honestly, sideline bunkers weren't much of a thing when Tom Morris was alive and designing. And those were kind of a later invention for the most part. So I'd say when it comes to courses to reference off of him, we lean more the Ash Ashkernish variety, where you kind of see a lot more of the just ruggedness of his courses. And do you have anything to add on that one? No, Dan? not really. Just yeah. the emphasis on natural naturalness. Um, yeah, if you look at as... Axel was saying in the chat, if you look at old pictures of, you know, Scottish Lynx courses, the bunkers are pretty, they're pretty, pretty scruffy. Um, so, yeah, you don't want, you don't want to try and make the neat sod wall bunkers. Plus, they, they're not worth the time. Yeah, the, they, 
kind of mess with playability. So yeah, that's just the warning for doing a Tom Morris style golf course. All right, moving on. We got Pete Dye, the geometrist. So Pete Dye is an interesting one because uh, you have to, Pete Dye kind of is all over the place with his golf courses. There's a lot of good and a lot of bad in Pete Dye golf courses to reference. So this is kind of a riskier one, I would say, to pick. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's because you could just think, oh, I just need to make uh, long waste bunkers and railroad ties, and that's fine. Then I've got it. Um, but yeah, I think we're, we're we definitely like kind of like what you're saying. I think I think you guys kind of get it. Like the, you know, okay, don't just make Harbor Town or TPC Sawgrass, right? Like learn about some of his lesser known masterpieces and uh and then go from there yeah and there's certainly a lot of things he did well so it's just a matter of basically picking out what you want to use in your golf course so mm -hmm. moving on to the next one we have george thomas uh a dan staple right here so i'm just gonna let him go right about it immediately Oh, okay. Um, I mean, it's ma mostly what's on the slide there. So obviously everyone knows like Riviera and LA Country Club and, you know, a lot of people know about Bel Air as well because a lot of his work is not, a lot of his work hasn't been very uh, well preserved. Um, actually, the LPGA is playing at P Palos Verdes this week. So if you think you're going to take GCT, watch the golf, watch the ladies golf this week. Um, but um yeah, so he was, I guess the main thing I would say is he, he thought that putting was overemphasized in golf, so he kind of actively avoided making really wild green contours. Um, so that's something I would certainly be looking for when I'm, when I'm playing. Um, but yeah, he was a real, really, real innovator. Um, certainly if you're, Jeff Shackelford's kind of like, knows the most about Jeff Shackelford or about George Thomas. So um, if you re read any of his stuff on George Thomas, that'd be a good source if you end up picking him. And uh, just a question for you, Dan, uh, do you think that for George Thomas courses, it's beneficial to stick with the California setting? Because he's mainly known for California. Golf That's courses. mainly what he's known for, but I don't know. I'd be willing. I, I, I'd go into this with a, with an open mind. Um, for sure. Um, okay. yeah. Plus I'm there are lots of different, there are lots of different now. settings in California, right? Like, yes. cause he designed like Stanford and he also designed, you know, things a lot in canyons and things and, you know, yeah. more kind of standard Parkland like courses. Uh, so. Okay. So that, I think that'll give people a good idea of what to expect from picking George Thomas. You don't have to set it in California, but uh, it's a choice not to, I would say. And then moving on, we have Coor and Crenshaw, the modern minimalists. And I, th I think this one's pr pretty straightforward. Uh, there's a lot of reference referenceable current golf courses, and none of them have been renovated or anything like that in terms of like them not being core and Grenshaw, so you can kind of pick and choose. There's, as I said, the B101 favorite uh, Warren Grenshaw template poll that I think you can find on almost every Ben course. Yeah, I think he uses it more often than they do. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. They, they like to use, they also like to use like a, like the subtle lion's mouth green on a short par four uh, as well. Mm, that's pretty yeah. common on their courses and yeah uh, i think uh, but we... yeah i guess the usual the usual warnings apply right like you know look beyond kapalua and sand hills yeah. you know all right moving on we have harry colt and yeah uh colt's another one where you kind of have to be careful because a lot of his work was uh misattributed to uh his fellow designers 
he himself didn't really leave the UK more than once or twice during his entire career. So I think looking mainly at his work in the UK is your best bet, as well as Utrecht to Pan, of course. But yeah, uh, just know that a lot of courses in the United States say they are a cult design and are not in fact a cult design so yeah i mean obviously he was i'd say like the the routing at pine valley is largely his mm -hmm. um doing but like obviously crump had, was the main visionary behind that but so he he did he like contributed to a lot of designs but yeah mm -hmm. most of the like the work that's most him is, you know, like your St. George's Hills, your Swindley Forests and things like that. Yeah. And uh, just just know that those are probably the better courses to reference when you're looking at Colt's design style. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll move on to the next designer, next architect, uh, Tillinghast. All right. Now, Tillinghast is another one where it, it's hard to know how much of Tillinghast is left in a couple of his courses? Well, I think the other thing with Tillinghast is he's very hard to pin down in terms of a mm -hmm. style. Um, yeah, obviously he was very, you know, he was famous for the Great Hazard, like 17 Vault to Stroll, and there's, like, there's a couple at Ridgewood, he's got one at Baltimore Country Club, and yeah, so... He 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 did have he did kind of have his favorite template holes like he all he liked using like he had his own version of the short hole. Um, he had another par three template he used a lot called the reef hole. So those are some things you might look for um, when you're when you're doing your homework. Yeah, uh, I'll move on to the next architect, uh, Perry Maxwell, the muffin man. Yeah. Oh. So just to be clear, some of these some of these uh, uh, nicknames are made up. <laughs> there aren't no nicknames for a lot of architects, so <laughs> it some of them are a bit made up. Yes. Uh, so this is an architect I have very little knowledge of outside of for Prairie Dunes specifically. So yeah. Originally, so he actually Prairie. he actually was. Uh, Mackenzie's design associate on Crystal Downs, because oh, right. Mackenzie, for like a lot of his American, his you know non, a lot of his American designs, he moved around. Um, yeah, you know, he was only there for a little bit, so like that's why, you know, his design associate on Cypress Point was Robert Hunter. Maxwell was kind of his Midwestern guy. Hmm. Okay. Let's move on to the next architect, Stanley Thompson, the Toronto Terror. <laughs> so I do know is Stanley Thompson's career was actually kickstarted by a Harry Colt and uh, our resident Stanley obsessive, uh, Maddie, uh, has a lot of strong opinions about Stanley. So uh, he might be the resident person to message if you have any Stanley questions. I'd say. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of afraid to say anything because I know Maddie will be. I can feel Maddie's eyes staring into my back. Any anything I say, so yeah, I would say just just look at the courses. I'd say just look at the courses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, um, doesn't have to be set in Canada, but that would be weird you know. to not be set in Canada, to be honest. But yeah. Uh, just look at his bunkering and the way he does the settings of his golf courses and integrates it into his sign work. You see Highlands links. There might be a certain Matty hole that looks very similar that's being pictured there. So, mm -hmm. all right, moving on to the next architect, uh, Mike Strantz. And this is another Thanks one. I'm like, yeah, he's he's not the horse. I promise. Uh, this is another designer similar to Pete Dye, where there's a lot of uh, things you can take from his courses, uh, not all of them positive, so you just kind of have to be yeah, kind of choosy. Yeah, I played two Strance courses in real life. One of one was was 
one was I felt like that was was a bit extra. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he definitely wasn't afraid to use bold, bold uh, features and blind shots. But I think Strance is a high risk, high reward pick. Yeah. Um, you can make something that's really unique, but you could also something that's just perplexing and bad. Yeah, like Strance's obsession with 90 degree dog legs is a thing. And I, I know in the past people have attempted Strance style courses and been pegged on the whole on not doing, well, on doing pretty crazy 90 degree dog leg holes. So just know that that might not always work out in your favor. <laughs> But yeah, I think like he would have bold, he would use bold features to play around. But like, I don't know, based in sort of like my, in my experience, it's like, oh man, I have to try this shot. And then you like pull it off. You can, it's actually not as hard as it looks and you feel good when you pull it off. Mm. Like, I think that's kind of the essence of, of Strance. Yeah, it, it, it's a lot of visual intimidation. All right, next architect. Walter Travis. So Walter Travis is an interesting one because uh, he did a lot of very unconventional things on his golf courses and really loved some insane features like crazy hummocking. His greens could be just absolutely wild. And is he responsible for the inverted bunkers on Garden City or is that a Devereaux? Yeah, I'm pretty sure because he basically... He basically redid all the bunkering because he re he redesigned it before the u.s open and i don't know, remember what year it was early 1900s um and so he basically just wanted to make the course a lot harder so he put in all those really deep bunkers um so i'm assuming the other ones are his doing as well um, yeah this is this is another one where uh you can let this get away from you and go a little yeah. bit too crazy uh but it, and people like the pictures of the crazy humps and buried elephant greens, but like if you look at Garden City, he has some features like that, but there are also other greens that are a little more kind of just lay of the land, um, you know, and kind of at grade. So, so you know, don't, you know, feel free to inject a little variety in your green sites if you're using Travis. They don't all have to be nuts. Yeah, and I know for a fact Cape Arundel has a full fried egg video, and you can kind of see not every hole at Cape Arundel is insane. There, it's kind of interspersed, like between heroic shots and different ones. Where, as you said, it it really varies. You don't want to do crazy on every single hole. All right, moving on, we have Tom Doak, and I think. Doak also has a lot of variety of style, so it's it's hard to pinpoint exactly his style down on paper, but I think I've Yeah, I think the the other thing that's helpful about Doak though is he all he's also writes a lot. So yes. there's a whole lot like, you know, he posts on Golf Club Atlas all the time. And he's on he has podcasts, so I think with Doak, at least with him, you can you can kind of get inside his mind a little more because he's written so much. Yeah. Um, whereas just looking at pictures of his courses might be a little hard to tease out things to riff on. Yeah. He's a big fan of really short par fours, though, too. I know listening to him before that, yeah, you can really hear his opinions on that. When he's given the room to do what he wants to do, he, he does a bit different stuff. And it's from hearing him talk, you can really see what courses he really got more free reign on and where his design style leaked through more. So, all right, moving on. All right. Uh, my favorite designer, Charles Hugh Allison. So for Allison courses, uh, just, just want to say, uh, Japan. Yes. Might be his best. He might have his best courses in Japan, but there's many other courses to reference. Uh, Royal Hague is a great reference point for Allison's style later on. Uh, even though he worked all over the world, all over the world. Uh, yeah, no, I'm just going to say Royal Hague and not bother with that pronunciation. 
Uh, just know that he was a big fan of forcing heroic shots or like uh, having people have huge risk reward shots over like probably the deepest bunkers of any designer during his time. And also some of the longest golf courses. So some of his courses have really held up well over the years in terms of still playing pretty difficult with modern era clubs. So yeah, just when doing an Allison course, just know that uh, he really disliked OB and water except as like a visual like treat. He would use ocean or water backdrops a lot, but he wouldn't use them in play necessarily as often. All right, moving on, we got William Flynn. Yeah, so um, William Flynn, he, um, I can't remember how exactly he got his start, um, but he, you know, obviously did a lot of work in the Northeast, a little bit in Florida too, but I don't think a lot, I don't, some of his Florida work remains. but a lot of it's been lost. Um, he, uh, there's, it was an interesting uh, case study. I think somebody shared it in the punch bowl on um, the country club of York where Ross and Flynn created competing routings. I thought, found that pretty illuminating. Um, and, but yeah, he liked, he, he, he wasn't afraid to incorporate like, you know, basically maximize the features on the, on the, uh, you know, that the land gave him. Um, So, whereas like, you know, Ross was more about, you know, okay, a lot of Ross courses tend to be a little more gentle walks around. Flynn would, wasn't afraid to, you know, say, take a slope on a little, maybe a slightly more directly. Yeah. Uh, I I would say shy away from doing a Shinnecock. Uh, once again, going back to that, like Shinnecock's probably his most known course, but uh, referencing a lot of his other courses, I think, is a better idea for the most part. But yeah, yeah, Lan- and Lan- Lancaster's hosting the U.S. Women's Open, so you'll I think that that's in at the end of May beginning of June so so you'll wanna you'll wanna watch that if you're if you get William Flynn yeah and uh, just going back to Axel's point uh, I think we'll have these slides themselves made available to everyone so they can look over these specific things that I didn't cover or go over in this shorter stream so yeah uh, those were our <laughs> 16 architects to choose from uh once again yeah they'll be listed in the thread tomorrow as axel said and uh once the window opens it'll be first come first 